But that old oh owl, he comes that old barred owl and goes, Ow, oh, 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 everybody this is jason hamlet and you are listening to the i hunt podcast the i hunt podcast is dedicated to bringing you guests from all over this great country who share the same passion as you do the great outdoors and more precisely hunting and fishing our guests will range from experts to people just like you and me each of whom will be able to provide us personal insight into the tactics and strategies they use in their neck of the woods. From hooks, hooves, wings, and webs, we will cover it all. As always, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And don't forget to rate and review. That means a lot. Thanks for listening, and let's get to the show. Yes, what is up? Welcome everyone to the show. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you who continue to tune in each and every week. This is the I Hunt Podcast, episode number 020 with the turkey man, Steve Evans. I am so excited for the show I have lined up for you today, guys. It's a, a Steve is a great guest and a wealth of knowledge, and we are going to get into that in just a minute. But first, we have to take care of some business. This episode is brought to you by 10 Star Products. Guys, having a great beard isn't the law, but you know what? It should be. 10 Star Products has everything the outdoorsman like me and you need to take care of his facial hair, like beard oil, beard balm, and mustache wax. They specialize in high desert scents like sagebrush, juniper, and pinyon pine to give you that rugged scent you're looking for. 10 Star Products was started by two brothers who are avid hunters and anglers. And they wanted to bring the sense of the Sierra Nevada foothills to every bearded sportsman. Every 10-star oil, balm, and wax is made by hand to ensure the products are of the highest caliber, caliber and purity. 10-star products are inspired by experiences, such as casting a line on your favorite stream or spotting that big buck at first light. Their goal is to take you to your favorite memories of field every time you use their products. Listeners of the iHunt podcast can right now get 25% off their order at 10starproducts.com using the promo code IHUNT at checkout. That's I-H-U-N-T because legendary beards deserve legendary care. And ladies, they have some awesome gift baskets available for you to pick up for your man whose beard is in need of some tending and some proper maintenance. So I encourage you all to check them out. Once again, that is 10starproducts.com, and you can get 25% off using the promo code IHUNT. And this episode is also brought to you by... Beaver Creek Game Calls. Beaver Creek Game Calls specializes in custom, handcrafted, and hand-tuned calls that are built one call at a time right here in the great U.S. of A. They put key focus on quality and make sure that every call that goes out is a call that they would personally take to the field hunting while putting an emphasis on customer service striving to treat customers as they would a member of their own family. Uh, Guys, this is a great company. 
a small company who is doing it the right way and producing beautiful products. Uh, I have a goose call from them, and it is a beautiful work of art, and I can't wait to get it in the field. So, guys, check them out. That is BeaverCreekGameCalls.com, and if you use the promo code IHUNT, that's I-H-U-N-T in all capital letters, you right now can get 40% off your order. So, it's a heck of a deal and a heck of a way to stock up on some calls for this upcoming season. Whatever your needs may be, duck, geese, turkey, uh, you're looking for some deer grunts, doe bleeds, they have it all. So check them out, www.beavercreekgamecalls.com, and use the promo code IHUNT for 40% off. And finally, this episode is brought to you by Sentinel Decoys. Those of you guys who've been listening to this show for a while know the relationship I've built with Steve Henson over at, Steve, at Sentinel Decoys. Uh, the guy is so awesome. Uh, go back and listen to episode 5 uh, where he talks about how he made the... Uh, how he came up with the idea and how the idea hit him to have this three-sided decoy. And he goes into uh, some of the tactics he used in creating it. And uh, one thing he uses is he uses, he uses uh, three sides on his decoy that gives like an am- animation quality to his decoy. Essentially, you're getting the same reaction that you would get out of like a robotic decoy in the field that you're going to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on from a nice portable fold-up decoy that isn't going to cost you nearly the amount of money that these high expensive decoys cost so check them out that is deerdecoy.org they have a bunch of videos there so you can see the uh, decoy set up and see it in action and see the uh, see the perspective of this decoy uh, as it the camera travels around 360 degrees and the decoy never loses the focus of staring exact right back to the camera it's truly amazing and ingenious uh product that steve has created so i encourage you all to check him out at www.deardecoy.org and also don't forget sentinel decoys is sponsoring our fan question segment of the show and next week is the last week and your last chance to submit a question to the guests of the show to uh for your chance at winning one of these lovely awesome decoys so keep an eye on my twitter feed for that opportunity to submit a question for next week's guest and uh, get your last chance to get entered into this contest and get you one of these decoys somebody who listens to the show is going to win it might as well be you that's it for sponsors and we're going to get into the show uh man all right guys that's it for sponsors and we are going to get into the show man I cannot wait for the upcoming deer season. It is coming so close. Before you know it, you're going to be sitting up in that stand before the sunlight, waiting for that sun to come up and waiting to hear the crackle of them leaves as that doe or that buck comes walling through the woods right in front of your arrow, and you can you can uh, get a nice successful harvest for your family. And just that feeling of getting that harvest. I mean, if you're like me, when you when you do put one on the ground, you just want to scream it from a freaking mountaintop and just tell everybody you know about your successful harvest. And uh, this season on the I Hunt podcast, I want to be your mountaintop. Essentially, if you're out there and you're an everyday list and you're an every week listener to the show and you're a fan of the show and you have a successful harvest and you want to come on the show and tell the story about it, then hit me up on Twitter. Uh, tag me in the picture of the harvest, let me know you're interested in coming on and talking about it, and I will set up a time to call you either that night or the next day so the story's still fresh in your brain and still fresh in your mind and the enthusiasm is still there. And you can kind of tell us how the hunt went, uh, have a nice 15, 20-minute conversation and uh, let, the, let the listeners hear about it and, uh, and just share your story with everybody. I know I would love to hear about it, and I'm sure the listeners will love to hear stories of successful harvest as they're fighting through on their season. So uh, if you're interested about doing that, like I said, hit me up on Twitter when you do have a harvest, and, and we'll set it up. Uh, I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you, um, and good luck this upcoming season. Without further ado, I'm going to bring on my guest for this week, uh, Steve Evans, the Turkey Man. Um, I do want to apologize up front. I was feeling a little under the weather when we did this interview, so I do sound a little nasally, and 
I, I'm sure you probably hear me sniffling a few times in the background, so you're just going to have to deal with that. Uh, but we struggled through it, and uh, it turned out to be a great podcast. Steve is a wealth of wealth of knowledge from a lifetime of hunting, and uh, we have a lot of fun, and it's a great conversation, so I hope you all enjoy. Welcome, Steve Evans. <laughs> Joining me on the phone today, you all know him and love him on Twitter as Turkey Man, a lifelong pro staff for PSE, my new buddy Steve Evans. Steve, welcome to the show, and thanks for taking some time out of your weekend to chat with me. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, I feel honored to be on your show, and I really appreciate uh, appreciate being here. Uh, I started listening to your podcast, and and the folks out there that hasn't been listening to podcasts are missing a treat. Oh, I appreciate uh, that so much, Steve. That's, that's awfully kind of you to kind of you to say about this little this little program I put together. You're putting a lot of pressure on me, so. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I enjoyed that uh, knocking on doors. I really did. Uh, I was wondering about that chicken. Did you ever go back and pick that chicken up and take it to the door? <laughs> Hell no! I ain't gonna go steal nobody's chicken, Steve. <laughs> No, no, you talk about that piece of property, and you talk about seeing some chickens, and uh, I was wondering if you went back out there and picked up a chicken and went to, went to the door and knocked, knocked and said, I brought your chicken back, by the way, who owns this property? Oh, that would have been a good strategy. I did I did drive <laughs> back up there after work uh, one day and stopped in to see if there happened to be somebody farming that land, and I didn't see the chickens, but I wouldn't have ever even thought about that. That would have been a good idea to... To see if I can that property there. I enjoyed that. Uh, I was uh, done over the years. I'm what, 67 year old now. And uh, over the years, I've knocked on a lot of doors. And uh, I always like to have an introductory. Somebody, you know, somebody, that cold contact is tough. Yeah. But I like to have somebody that I can say, hey, Jason told me about about you guys and, you know, kind of give you in the door. I always like that, that approach. Yeah. But around here, around here where we hunt, Jason, uh, private land's tough. So I have to hunt a lot of public land. Oh, really? Yeah. So I do the topo maps, and I look at, uh, I look at, private land that bumps up to it that's got crops and stuff and try to utilize that. Sometimes you have to go in by boat. Sometimes you have to hoof it. Okay. But uh, I was turkey hunting one day and I was coming off a piece of public land and uh, we'd been turkey hunting over there and this guy that owned the property right next to it. I come right down the fence row. I was on the public side. He's on the other side of the fence. And he... uh he leaned up against that fence and he was watching us. So I, I said, hey, how you doing today? And he said, this is my property. I said, your property right there? He said, yeah. He said, that's my turkey. And I said, these are your turkey over here? I said, I didn't know that. <laughs> he said, yeah, these are my turkey. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I looked at watching it. Getting almost time for the lumber company's closed. And I said, you better get down there to the lumber yard and get that fence a little higher. I said, them suckers, get now. 
<laughs> you ruined all kinds, Jay. So he was trying to say that the wild turkey that was on public land were his turkey. Oh, yeah, that was his turkey. That was his turkey. <laughs> he fed them turkeys. He raised them turkeys. That was his turkeys. Oh, my God. I just told him. A wild, Raise that fence a little higher. They're getting out. <laughs> a wild eastern turkey is his is his turkey. Yes, sir. that's hilarious. But you run into all kinds. You do, especially when it comes to hunting, man. People people get a little crazy when it comes to their hunting property and their uh, their game that's on their land. You know, uh, which rightfully so. I mean, some you know people put a lot of effort into their land and a lot of effort in their property. So you know, I mean, some people approach it in different in a bunch of different ways. Some people are. Uh, understanding of the laws and some people just like you said that's my turkey that's my deer <laughs> and we pay for it by by the license and, and of course i know for myself i spent a lot of shoe leather leather checking you know the oaks and food food source and an acre property when they when they stock the deer down in this neck of the woods because we didn't have deer growing up we didn't have deer in this area at all. Didn't have very many turkey. Turkey right. had to go to the mountains. Yes. And there's just certain spots that you could go hunt growing yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, being 67 like you are, I mean, you've had a, a lifetime of hunting that a lot of us out here uh, only dream of, of having when we reach your, reach your age. And it's like you've been able to see the uh, coming and goings of all different kinds of game animals. Like you said, from seeing no deer and no turkey to now having an abundance like you guys do. I mean, it's just, uh, it has to make you feel pretty proud of the uh, all the work that's been put in by the uh, local DNR and all the money you've paid into the system over the years to see that it's coming to fruition for the future generations like myself and my kids how old is your kid my boy is three years old well it won't be long and and you know if you're raising in the wild you know going out and in and, and nature and 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 being out like that you know you won't regret it buddy you won't regret it there's nothing in this world better than passing something on that you've learned that can be passed on to the next generation. Oh, better. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, that really is uh, one of. I mean, there's been, there was a few reasons that got me into hunting in such a late late age, and one of them was having my boy and wanting to be able to learn for myself so that I could pass it on to him. So give him that, give him that experience and that uh, that uh, to pass on to his kids. You know, because I started looking at my life and looking at the things that I know and like what what I could pass down to my boy and. Uh, Hunting seemed like something for me to get into and learn, so that I can pass down to pass that pass that around to him. So, I definitely hear you on that one. I would I'd recommend I I did this for my daughter. She's twenty two now, and uh, but when she was, you know, just a little older than your son, I'd say five or maybe six, you know, a few years older. Uh, I wanted to teach her to shoot. So I bought a crossbow, got a Barnett uh, Wildcat, mm-hmm. and uh, with scope on it to teach her how to shoot. And she's a crack shot now. And I I did that so that if she decided that she want to go deer hunting, that we could take that and she could have success. Uh, you know, and I could be in the blind with her or in the tree stand, but I got that to teach her how to shoot. And I think that's a real tool for teaching youth where they could be successful. And I highly recommend that because archery is archery. It's like everything else when you go to when you go to arguing about stuff about this, you know, compound or or am I still there? Yeah, you're still here, I'm listening. Okay. My phone went like it like I lost you. I said, but you know, people traditional people you know, I used to, several years back, especially, you know, the ones that traditional, compound, and then the crossbows, then they'd argue amongst themselves that archery is archery. Yeah. And if I choose to hunt my recurve, my longbow, then that's, you know, that's what I enjoy doing. If I pick up my compound, same, you know, our crossbow. And once you get age on, I mean, the crossbow, it kind of, for an old bow hunter like me, it, it's awkward. Because uh, you're limited, you you feel it's just not comfortable when you sit in a tree stand. You know the years I've done that, it just doesn't feel 
a part of you. The, and, uh, the crossbow doesn't? No, it doesn't. It doesn't feel natural to me. Okay. Because over the years I've hunted with either recurve or, or compound. But that doesn't mean that hunting with crossbow is bad, you know? No, I mean, you know, that's one thing I've definitely noticed. I mean, in the few years I've been hunting is it seems like there is a... Uh, there is, you know, your recurve and your trad bows guys will dog on your compound guys, and your compound guys are going to dog on the crossbow guys, and then the uh, the whole archery community dogs on the gun hunters, and then it's like, you know, we are all the same. You know, we're all out trying to do the same thing. And I, you know, I'm guilty of it sometimes too, where you know I'll say stuff about people who gun hunt, and and I, it's not right. You know, it's not it's, it's just not the right frame of mind to go into a situation. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that there's a, an inner inner it's not really fighting. It's more like jockeying for a position atop of the atop of the heap of the difficulty. What do you think that is? Well, I started when I was nine, and of course, you know that would when I was nine would be nineteen fifty nine. So uh, I started at a real young age of hunting with a bow, even though I did you know I hunted with a gun also. I liked to uh, shoot and I liked to you know. Do, do other things with with the gun, you know. But mostly when kids, and especially when I got into school, and uh, I had a, an old uh, uh, pickup truck, a 58 model pickup truck that I drove from the time I was probably 8th grade on through high school. And uh, most of the kids in that period of time, I mean, where I grew up, We'd have a single shot twenty two in the in the window, uh fishing rod in the window, park park to school. Never one of us had one. I mean that's just the way we were raised. Mm-hmm. And uh in my in my in my I had a, a recurve bow and fly fly rod. Well, you know, I used to spin a rod, but I liked to fly rod too, you know? Mm-hmm. I like to fight we, I grew up on a little Tennessee River, which was great fishing, man. I, I miss that little Tennessee. But, uh, you know, I, I'd hunt with Marie Curve, and I small game hunt with Marie Curve. I'd hunt, like to hunt. We call them whistle pigs down here, like groundhog hunt. Go, go frog hunting. We'll, we'll take a, you know, bow and shoot frogs. You know, if, if, it, if it's hunting, I was, I was there. I was all about it. You know. Well, the, it wasn't cool. You know, it wasn't a cool thing to do. But when I was doing it, it was, he was a minority, and I'd be poked at. There comes that old bow hunter, <laughs> old Steve. He's hunting bow, you know. And and I was doing it before it was cool. And so uh, later on, after I graduated, and, and uh, uh, you know, I killed deer too with my recurve, and, and uh, I hit the twenty twenty one. Uh, they went in the recurve where the compound come on the market. And uh, Jennings, uh, Pat and Jennings, Jennings Compound, the guy, that, he, he's the one that designed the compound bow. And he come out with a bow, and it, it looked like something for Star Wars. All right. And uh, it was so bulky. And so uh, it just, if, 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 if you ever get an opportunity, I'm sure there's some somewhere in the archives. The cable's real big. It was, it was just to patent the idea. But I bought one of them and uh, tried to hunt with it. It just is like it just didn't feel natural. Hearing that little stick and string, and that thing was weighed, I seemed like ten pounds at the time. It felt like carrying a crossbow now, but. Uh, I don't remember the weight on it, but then and then I said Jennings, but that was Allen that came out with Patton. I'm, I'm sorry, but Jennings did come out with a compound, and I bought one of them. I bought Allen, which which patented. I said Jennings. I'm sorry. Okay. But Allen's the one that patented, and then Jennings come out off the patent and made a compound, and uh, it was bulky. It was better, but it's bulky. And then uh, about 74, 1974, I believe it was, uh, PSC 
come on the market. Okay. And uh, Pete Shipley, he uh, he's the president and the and the uh, daddy of precision shooting equipment. And uh, in 1975, 1975, I believe it was, we'd go to LBL, and I I, I still go out there occasionally. The Land Between Lakes. Okay. On, oh, you know where that's at? Uh, I didn't know what LBL was until you said Land Between the Lakes, but yes, now I know. Okay. And uh, we'd go out there and, and hunt a week or two, and, you know, maybe two you know, break it up a week at a time and maybe take two trips out there. And uh, I run into out there uh, via, you know, by a friend of mine that uh, that I hunted with, uh, of Larry Boring. I run into, uh, we run into Pete Shipley out there, and he come in, and we hunted with him and got to know him. And uh, I'm vertically challenged. You know what that means? You're short like I'm me. Short. <laughs> I'm short. So, and especially back then, a short draw length, if you got a short draw length, then you, your bow set on the same poundage is not going to going to be as fast as, as nobody with longer draw length. Okay. Same poundage. It's not going to be as fast. I didn't know that. But that's, that's, that's good information to know. So us short guys, we have to pull a, a heavier draw weight, huh? Well, that, well, the, the technology now has changed it enough that it's not as much. If you look at their uh, feet per second, and it's like 310 or 300 whatever feet per second, it's it's, it's usually uh, tested on 29 inch draw. Okay. Or, and, and sometimes, tw- in some cases, they will do 30 inch with longer draw. It's not, it's not tested on the shorter draw. Now, let me stop you for real quick. How important is it to know your uh, what you're shooting in feet per second, per second wise? Because that's one thing I've never set my bow up to check, and I've never I've never put it on anything to to see how fast it's shooting. Is that a is that a mistake that I'm making, or as long as I know I'm putting deer on the ground and getting my well, past? Deer well, on. not not for me. Now, the only thing that would come in place if you was uh, shooting like three D. 3D targets, and you shoot, and uh, uh, and that was the the faster it would shoot, the flatter it would shoot. So the further you could get your pin, you know, get your distance if you shoot a pin. Mm-hmm. Your first pin, instead of being 20 yard, 30 yard, it would be maybe 40 yard. So you could shoot that target with one pin and misjudge. Five yards. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But bow hunting, you know, the way I look at it. Now, people ask me, how many turkey I kill? I have no idea. Kill a lot. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have no idea. But the but bow hunting, I kept up my bow killed with tails because that's my first love. That's why when fall comes, I get fired up about it. You know, bow hunting deer. You know, I used, to, you know, I didn't even have a rifle for a long time deer hunting. Deer, uh, I just hunted with a bow until probably in the 90s, early 90s. But uh, for several years there, from 1976 to 19, I guess it was 1989 or 90. Now, 76, we didn't have a beer. I averaged four deer a year for bow. In 76? From 76 up to the 90s. Holy I killed 102 God. whitetails my bow. Wow. But, uh, you know, that that's, was my way of life. Like I say, I was doing it when it wasn't the cool thing. When I graduated, the kids that I graduated, when they, when they got... You know, in their 30s, then they started wanting to bow hunt. Well, they want to start bow hunting because at that time, for 10 years or so, you know, they come by, come by the house and I'd have a deer hanging. And I killed the bow. And so, you know, I've got the opportunity to pass it on and teach other people how to bow hunt. 
how to shoot a bow. But, but you know, of all the deer I've killed, I probably count on my hand the number of whitetails I've taken, you know, beyond 30, 35 yards. Everything's been inside that, but I always set up for funnels, and I set up what I, what I started out knowing that a bow was short, close, that I had to worry about the, uh, the deer, you know, jumping the strain. Uh, I, I made the shot where I could get it in 10 to 15 yards and passed and knew my limitation. And I considered myself a better hunter than a, than a, than a, than a marksman or archer. Even though I was a decent shot, but I always felt like I knew my limitations and I stayed within it. Okay, so if you... If you you said you count in your hand the amount of deer you've taken over thirty five yards, is that because were yeah. you letting a lot of deer pass? I'm guessing that absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. What, what are the things that needed to line up for you to take that shot at thirty five yards? Well, you know, a lot of a lot of people I learned I learned pretty early that you could you could talk to a deer, <laughs> you could speak to the deer. It's, you got to uh, go into that one, Steve. <laughs> okay. You could grunt. You could get a response. You could bleat. You know, you get a response because, you know, you spend the hours I've logged in a tree, that I've logged in the woods, then you learn by what the, you know, animals tell you, what you hear, the sounds. And that's, you know, in this day and time, people... Don't understand that. Back when I was younger, before I got introduced to 13 or so years that I worked in a factory, uh, you know, when I was younger, younger, we have the sense of smell. We have, we have all the senses that we have. And it's, they become, we use them, but now we don't. I could smell a squirrel when I was, you know, 10 or 20. 10 year old out there squirrel hunting or 11, 12 year old, I could smell it because the sense it wasn't it wasn't painted. Huh. And that's, that's really that's really hard for somebody to understand. And I know I know that. But I when I was talking about talking to animals, a deer, if you bleat at him, you go, you stop. Okay, now. When he stops, he's also going to be looking toward the sound. It's like you walking past me, and I say, Jason, well, you're going to stop, and you're going to look at me. But I, but the thing about it is what I had to figure out is how to stop Jason in the hole I could shoot. Mm-hmm. And also be ready to shoot. So we, we were planted on this earth because we have gravity. Gravity holds us down. Well, when you pick your foot up, Jason, to start to make a step, if I said, Jason, then you're going to go on with your cadence and you're going to step that next step and then stop. Right. So I watch you pick your foot up and, and you start to make a step and I said, Jason, you're going to stop. Then he stopped, stops in the hole. You stopped in the hole. You stopped where I could see you. There's a visual here for me. So if I'm drawed, I see the hole he's going to stop in, rather than shooting at him moving, I want to take the shot at standing still there and try to make the most humane shot, put it in put it in spot. And uh, so when he picked his foot up, he started to step in that hole. Whack. He set her down. When he looked up, of course, I'm 20, 25 up, you know, foot up a tree, and you don't want to be skylining. You know, I've learned a long time ago that your shadow would spook them, you know, sun coming in and the shadow you moved out there in front of you. So those things you pick up by failing. I learned the hard way. I learned by, you know, I didn't have all these uh, shows that you see and people in instructional videos my heroes was, was people like Fred Byer and you know Pope and Young and, and uh, 
Harry Hill, and those guys. Those are what I, I, I absorbed and what I read and, and, uh, and you know, people that my classmates, friends of mine, they, they didn't understand that. But uh, I grew up, that's what I always wanted to be. That's what, what I always wanted to do. I, you know, I'd come in with uh, squirrels, rabbits. Uh, in hunt with groundhog, I killed my recurve. I, I said, I'm going to get this mounted. <laughs> I said, well, this is a hundred. If I take my recurve, I'm going to have it mounted. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it, the trophy is, is, is in the eye beholder, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about that experience that you, uh, that you get out of shooting it's, that animal. It's, it's, it's not to have big a point. It, if, if, if anybody's hunted any period of time at all, that old mature lead doe is as tough a, a tough a quarry to take on with a bow as ever been. Really? And that, yeah, I mean, she, she'll blow the whistle on you. She, she will, she will, she knows her, she knows her territory, and she she is on the alert, and she will pick you out. It's it just uh, it just it's it's I get excited. Now, does I get that, fired up. Does that old I get mature, fired up. Does that does that old mature doe get even tougher if she has a fawn by her? Yes, yes. I mean that's that's the that's that's one of the reasons why, but. But she puts several years behind her. Then she's been, she ain't, you know, she's seven and a half year old. Well, she's been around, you know. Mm-hmm. For sure. She's, she's, she's had to, to over, over. Uh, she's lived, per se. And uh, so, when when somebody puts a I don't know how big antlers are. Yes, ain't nobody likes like that. There's nothing like that. Them big old seven and a half year old a, a buck, seven and a half year old. Uh, he's sharp too. But I'm telling you what, that old doe is is equal. <laughs> I mean, old buck, he, uh, you know, they just they're equal, and uh, uh, they they've lived, they've lived, and. Uh, a lot of things you pick up, you know, like I, I'd use, you know, we didn't have trail cam. This technology is new to me. I mean, totally new to me. Yeah, how do you, uh, uh, how do you view the, the phone I got? How do you view the way, uh, the way the game has shifted now with trail cameras and all the different hunting apps that people are using to look at the uh, GPS and to look at, uh, look at the topography and just and to know exactly where they're at in the woods and to be logging locations and I mean how do you view that as an old timer and what the sport has turned into? Well I can't I can't say that I don't enjoy it because I do enjoy it. Uh, uh to have, you know, trail cams out and, and you know my wife, she she doesn't, you know, do outdoor things much, but she get on back four wheel and go and go Pull the trail, you know, the cards and and look at the game. And, I mean, it's it's neat. I, I get excited about it. Uh, it's a, uh, but you know, growing up and in, in, in the old school, uh, I I'd use a I use a sewing thread to check check a trail. You know, a go in thread. Fight, what do you mean? I take sewing thread, you know, like like you sew your button on your shirt with, uh-huh. and tie and tie it up over the trail, and then come back through and check it, see if that trail's fresh. Oh. See if you broke it. I I didn't pay attention to the. Uh, you'd be walking through the woods and be fighting spider webs. Mm-hmm. You'd be fighting them. Then all of a sudden you're not, and you, you know. Probably in the last you know twelve hours that deer broke in spider webs, a lot of traffic on it. That's a that's especially a... being short like being short like me, you know, I'm not gonna pick the ones up. I'm 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 getting poor deer would would break it, you know. 
Yeah, that's a great little piece of useful information, the spire webs, that I never even considered. And I mean, even like in this day of age, it, it gives you a good idea on where you're going to place your trail cameras at in the in the season, on what, what would be a hot trail would be one where you did notice there was no spider webs walking it. And, you know, tra- trailing deer, I'm, you know, I've tracked a lot of deer, trailed them, you know, archery, an era, a broadhead, it kills by hemorrhaging, you know, mm-hmm. the, the gun kills by concussion. So we got to have, you know, a youth long shoot. One, he's probably going to run, you know, 100 yards uh, and pile up, depending on the terrain. Uh, and so you're going to have to trail it. And you get one that maybe you've made a, made a bad shot or not as good a shot, but it is a vital shot, and you're going to have to stay on that trail. Especially in early bow season, you know, you 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 pick up a leaf, you look for a spot, you know, you have you been enough that you've been where I'm at, where I'm talking about, and trailing one that you really got to get down to trail it. Oh yeah. You you, you look for them leaves, you look for them leaves, and then you lose your spot, you lose it. Yep. Well, carry your compass number one. Carry your compass. Always take your compass to the tree because. It's it's a good tool. I'll give you this. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna back the trail in here, man. But if you're in a tree and you shoot an arrow at a deer, then if you'll mark where that deer was standing when you get down, then you won't be having to look and make you you know, mark that tree you stand standing by. We'll take your compass and mark it, set it, get down out of the tree, go to that tree that you've marked. Then you can start looking for your blood. That's one good use of, of a compass. If you're sitting in a place and you're looking uh, open woods, you know, laser fall, and you see deer moving, and you take that compass, and you can mark a tree or, or a spot, then you can go to that spot, especially if, if you see deer feeding around a particular oak out there and they're feeding around and around, when you get down and you get on the ground, it's a different vision, especially, you know, in these hill country and you've got some rolls to it. You get down and you lose that, you'll be looking over a ridge, you know, over yeah. a hump. But it'll help you in that place, in that direction. But if you got your compass and we're tracking the deer, look for look for the ants and on the lease. Ninety percent of the time you look at one, there'll be a spot of blood that those ants would get on. Look for the flies on them. And yellow jackets. So look at those things. Those small things will help you. And then that compass, if you're losing the direction, you can mark where you're at, your last drop of blood, put you a line on that compass. Because he'll, he'll veer off it, but he hit a line, and you'll stay on the line until he changes that line. So you can stay on that line with that compass and pick oh. it up again. I see what time. you're saying. I see what you're saying. That's a that's a good that's a good piece of advice there. Uh, nowadays, I mean, I mean, what I do now is since I have my normally have my cell phones in the woods with me and I have my GPS apps, <laughs> I uh, mark my blood trail and mark little plots on my map as I'm walking, and then when I do lose it, I can kind of follow the line that that I see the blood trail run into and kind of just envision where he's going to go next and hopefully I can pick it up. It's kind of probably the same way you're using with the compass, but it's more of an overhead view of the... Well, see, what I have found with, with these uh, iPhones and stuff, from my, I've had an iPhone about a year. And uh, when I got on Twitter in 19... I see, uh, 2016, January 2016... Uh, I got on with a laptop, and I had, I had not, you know, I didn't know how to use a computer a few, few months before then, so I was just learning on the laptop. My daughter kind of showed me what to do, so I had a flip phone up to then, and uh, then I got an iPhone about about a year ago almost, and uh, but I was learning a lot of stuff off of it I didn't know, and uh, but I do know one thing is. Places I go, a lot of places I go, 
I ain't got no cell. You know, I ain't got no. I can't get no cell tower. Oh, that could be a problem. So if you don't have a connection, then you gotta have pumps. So I still gotta have my pumps <laughs> because then I can't use those apps and stuff. In, in a lot of places, it's, it's strange. You don't have to be. I heard, I heard you talking on when you podcast of not having a, you know, the bars or something other to pick up your app. Uh, I don't remember which one it was that you talked on, um, but uh, if you don't have if you don't have the bars, then the app's not gonna work or your phone's not gonna work. That's so a very. Before, it's a very good point. Now, uh, let's say you do get a, uh, you are tracking a trail and you you marked your compass and uh, you're you're you've lost your blood trail and you're heading off in that direction and you do not find the blood. What is your next move to find that deer? Well, then I'm going to I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to come back because I've seen deer that go up to a certain point and turn. And go back, go back the direction it come, and then bear off that trail, and go and take another direction. And usually, when they take another direction, they will they will take a straight line for a period of time until they change direction again. <laughs> but that compass will let you stay on track. But I'll backtrack. I'll do the circling. Then I go to looking for. Well, I always look for you know little limbs broke. You know. I look for the leaves and the tracks, you know, direction of it. I, you, you, you've got to, you've got to read the sign, and that's where, that's where, with this generation, it's, it's, they, they've lost the where I grew up. Where I grew up hunting rabbits, I find them sitting, and I, I see an eye, I see a, a near. I see a little patch, you know, in the brush to get my shot and shoot my bow. Uh, you you got to slow down. And you come down to a slower speed than this generation's used to. Oh, yeah. And so you got to take a deep breath, back up, and, and, and just start looking at the leaves and the sign. And, you know, I remember one time, I was tracking a deer, and it, it had went, and it, my cousin had shot it, and it, he came and got me, and I was tracking it. It went about 50 yards, and I'm tracking it, and I noticed that in in the one track, there's a front leg, but one one of the one of the hoof marks in the track and the leaves was blood, and the arrow he showed me. There was no, there was no talon on it. There was no blood on it, but he had blood. And uh, we went about 50 yards, and the deer got up. And I backed off, and I said, this deer is hurt. You're going to kill this deer, but you, what you've done is you've cut an artery. It's like cutting your wrist. You know, somebody cut their wrist. That brought his, when they went through the shooting Three bladed, uh, cut on contact, broadhead, and one of the blades went through, and it's a little bit of talent on one blade, and it cut that artery above the front hoof on his leg. And so we backed off and left it alone, went back in there after we lunch, and it was dead. It bled out. But you've got to understand where you shot, where your placement was, look at your air, understand it, and then when you're tracking the deer, understanding what you're looking at. You're looking at the foamy blood, the pink foamy blood, the long shot. You're looking at the real dark, dark blood. That's a liver shot. You're looking at, at, at the blood that's got got uh, grit and stuff in it. It's got gut shot. All those will, deer will die. It will kill the deer. Now, where you can recover it is up to you understanding what's going on, that you understand what's happening, you understand what you're doing, and then you've got to, at that point, you start uh, understanding and if he's got a shot and there's water around, he's probably going to end up close to water, creek, 
you know, pond, lake. He's probably going to end up close to water. Probably going to end up in a thicket. I see him pile up in a brush pile. But you just got to circle, stay with it, and look at it. But if you'll, if you, those ants, honestly, uh, the, they'll tell tale. They will, they will, they'll come to the top and just be, you know, in the leaves. And I don't know how many times I picked it up and right there underneath that leaf, you know, where you got kicked over was drop of blood and pick it back up. But slow down and just stay with it, knowing that, uh, a gut shot deer, you just gonna have to back, back off and leave it. Uh, lever deer, who wants a shot in lever, he'll die, just give him, give him a little bit longer and he'll die. One shot's far through the hip, uh, cut that main artery, and he's a dead deer. Identify what you hit, where it's at, and, uh, you owe it to yourself, you, you owe it to the animal to stay, stay with it. It's That's not right. a, I mean that's 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 the responsibility of us as a bow hunter and uh, as a hunter in general general. And uh that's the reason that I have a different philosophy and a lot of people I, I look at things a lot differently. Uh hopefully one of these days that we can sit around a campfire and and uh and I can pass on 'cause there ain't nothing nothing more, you know, thrilling to me. I mean, we'd be frog hunting, we'd be catching pigeons, uh, you know, that's a blast, son. Catching pigeons for, to, to train dogs with, that's a blast. <laughs> How do you catch a pigeon? Well. Are you like, uh, Rocky out there in the chasing around no, in the woods? No, no, <laughs> no what, what, around, around here we've, we've got, we've got them bridges that you go over, uh, go in the creeks, you got bridges and they'll be, They'll be up about oh ten ten foot high, you know, from 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 the lake up to the bottom of it. Be about ten foot high, uh-huh. and uh, some of them be a little shorter. And you take one of them paint the uh, roller uh, poles, uh, extension poles, uh-huh. and put your dip net on it. And get you get you get you a cage to put your pigeons in. Get you good. Spotlight. Take you take your billfold. Anything you don't want wet, you take it out. You go you go at night when they're on that bridge, and you catch them with a dip net in the spotlight. And you talking about a wild ride. I've seen people end up in the lake. You get excited trying to catch one like a big butterfly net. And <laughs> 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 you swing, swing at pigeon. But the thing about you learn, you you swing at that pigeon. But you learn that the guy that holds spotlight, they hold it up there, uh, they'll 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 go back to that light and sit down. So not try to blind the guy, but you know, we we catch you fifteen thirty at a night and come back and then I'll I use them trained dogs with. But then we'll we'll set up a like over a pond and uh and shoot some flyers for the dogs. Uh and you can, they're, they're good to, to take out there and plant for point and breed and work, work the dog in, point, flush him, shoot, uh, retrieve, freeze them, and use them to throw for the dogs to retrieve. Uh, so that's a hoot. That sounds like, that sounds like a pretty crazy time. You're essentially just got a big butterfly net and you're just scooping them up the <laughs> bridge. <laughs> yep. A spotlight and a John boat. I thought it was gonna be a little bit more sophisticated than that. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> oh no, no. Oh, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, I've got I've got frogs. That's right. You need to get you a big net cake with you. Mate. Next time chickens run loose, you catch it. Go to, the <laughs> go to the neighbors there and say, "Is this your chicken?" By the way. Yeah, he'd probably be like, what the, yeah, that's my chicken, what the hell are you doing with it? <laughs> well, I brought it back to you, can I not? <laughs> yeah. So we kind of, we kind of ran off on a tangent there, we, we were talking We were about, on rabbit too, ain't we, son? <laughs> we were talking about, uh, your hunt with Shipley out there in, uh, 
With Pete Schiff, yeah, and laying between the legs, and you start on that, and somehow we we got off. Well, we ended up like we. And that's why I'm saying I can run a rat, but you got to keep me on track. <laughs> but so let's Pete take, take was, that build, back was up. building was build, building PSC bows, and he 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 would he build me a bow, and I got I got affiliated with PSC over those years, and uh, I I see him out there, and he build me a bow. Because I was short, he would build me one a little faster bow. In 1978, I killed the largest whitetail weight-wise, not rack, but weight-wise, that had been taken with a bow uh, at Field Rest 209. Wow. It was 8.7, it was seven and a half year old. Holy cow. And, and uh, Pete built me a little, little bow as split limb uh, uh, it was a two wheel he used to have a four wheel with the it's called citation he come out and he came a little split 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 limb uh two wheel a two wheel bow uh it, it had two cams a cam you know it wasn't a single cam or even though he designed that later on but he had a, a two cam bow and uh shooting a Double X seventy five twenty sixteen double X seventy five aluminum shaft. If anybody ever asked you, uh, you know what the you know twenty sixteen twenty one seventeen and aluminum shaft, what that is is the twenty is the outside diameter of that shaft okay. one hundred, and the sixteen is wall thickness and balance. I was shooting the 2016 uh, XXM5 aluminum shaft with a three-bladed satellite blade. There's a, I like fixed blades. I don't like expandable. That's a, that's a topic in its own. And uh, it shot, I was, on, I was shooting 67 pounds, 67 pounds what I believe it was, and it was chronographed at 213 feet per second. And at that time, that was fast. Yeah. Did you hear what half his land? It was 67 pounds. <laughs> and he shot 213 feet per second. <laughs> That'd shoot about and that was fast. 313 now, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Wow. So, uh... I, and during that period, you know, during those years and stuff, and I, I would go, uh, Larry, he, he was, uh, he was a self rep, and uh, so I was his uh, staffer, his pro staffer, and uh, he put a seminar on it, like Bass Pro or something like that. And I, I'd go work, you know, for him, and, and uh, of course, I, period of time I worked for Bass Pro as a boat tech. Worked for Academy as a boat tech. Worked uh, at my own little shop for years uh, and working a job. So, you know, kind of been there, done that. Uh, was doing it before it reached the where it's at now, and it's big business. But Pete, uh, PSC, PSC Pete, uh, he, he is, has got so many patents out there. He patented a single cam, which Matthews come out with, or and they had to get the patent rights from from uh, Pete. And I'm thinking, I could be wrong, but that's what I was told. And I come from a reliable source in that. But uh, I believe it was 50, 50 bucks for a bow that Matthews had to pay PSC for every bow, bow they they sold. Dang, that's so a good deal. That patent right. That pattern, right? But uh, there's a, there's a lot of good bows out there. The main thing, it's got to fit you. It's got it's got to feel comfortable to you. You've got to have good arrows to match them, match your bow, and you have to have the broadheads, in which will fly good. Yeah, you know, you know, Steve. That's one thing that I that I'm ignorant on is is this is all the 
is the bows and all the different bows that are out there right now. I mean, I have my one bow that I've shot for the last three years. It's the only bow I know anything about, and I, I like, I, I just don't get into all the specs and all the, all the mumbo jumbo of the feet per second and. I, I just don't get into it. I, I don't. I don't know like all the different brands. I mean, which one's better? You know, I shoot a Hoyt right now, a Hoyt Intruder, and I got it turned up as high as I can turn it up, and I'm shooting heavy arrows. That was that's kind of the strategy I'm going with to shoot it as hard as I can and as heavy as I can shoot and do some damage with it. That's that's kind of the, the strategy as a novice what, guy and in going into it. What I recommend. For somebody starting out in particular, is to know if you got the right weight of bow, is sit down and pick your feet up. You know, sit down in a, in a chair and, and pick your feet up where they're not on the floor and draw it. And you can come from from you know and draw it back comfortably. Then I think that you've got a bow that's not overbowed for you. But a person has to point it to the sky. They're gonna shoot the moon, pull <laughs> it down, and and get it back. Then you're over. You're you know you've it's it's too much weight for you. Right. Because the thing about it is, where we have to get as a bow hunter to make that shot, we have to make that movement of drawing it. Now, if he draws it. If we get it dropped now, it's a matter of put it put it in spot. And that's what I was talking about earlier. Deer's walking through. I see the hole he's going to walk in. When he picks his foot up, I've drawed. When his head went by a tree and he moves, I've drawed. When he steps, he steps in it. I, I blink when he starts to sit down. And at that point, he stopped. I settle in on, on, on behind the ribs. Hard area. I like to shoot. I like to hold low, and that way, if he moves down, I've got him, and then it will be too high hit, and mm-hmm. you know, let it go. But that drawing, drawing the bow back, that movement, that's where we get busted. That's where I, over the years, that's where I've got busted time and time again, is trying to draw the bow, because especially. It's pretty easy. It's easier if he's got one deer, but you got six or seven deer standing around you, around around your tree stand. Oh yeah. You got that that many set of eyes, plus the wind, you know, picking up your scent. Oh but, yeah. Uh, little little things beat big things. I've I've been busted. Uh, I've been busted a few times drawing. One thing that I, I've that I've made myself do now is uh, since since I've started hunting, actually, is any time I see a deer. And it's coming in, even if I have no intention of planning on shooting this deer, I'm always practicing getting to full draw, finding that spot where I can get to full draw on that deer, just so that it kind of give myself give myself some practice in that situation, you know what I mean, a, like a live situation. Have you, have, you busted, have you had a deer bust you because they've seen you move from the shadow of the sun? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not that good of a hunter, Steve. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. Is is it important? And see, turkey, turkey is the same way in this regards. If you sit up in sunlight, you're gonna get busted. You've got to be back, back in the shadows. You got to be back, you know, where, where that that movement you make is not gonna bust you. Uh, mm-hmm. How many times you sit in a tree stand and you see a you see a crow or big bird fly across and you see that shadow you see the shadow before you see the bird yeah yeah and uh but it's little things uh how many times you've been sitting in a tree stand and you hear a squirrel bark well some scoop you know some some it might be a hunter it might be a might be a coyote could be a deer could be a turkey but Pay attention, that's what I'm saying. Listen to the sounds. You know, they is nothing. nothing. I mean, I get get excited. uh, And when I don't, I'll be ready to bury me. I get get excited as a kid 
as when I was a kid, be in a tree stand for daylight, and you'll hear those birds. That's night birds that be, you know, they'll be, they'll be going, you know, going, going, you know, they'll be, they'll be quiet, they'll be shut down. You hear old turkey uh, out there on that limb, you'll, you'll go on. You'll hear, hear your mama coon coming through there, and she's having young, she's here and fussing with one another. All that, you know, before daylight, you, you can't see, you're waiting for daylight to come. And then that crack of daylight, they start to crack daylight. I don't care if you, you know, from the woods, perky hunting. I don't care if you tree stand, you know, deer hunting, duck blind. But you're out there for you, before it gets daylight. And then you'll hear that crow. And that crow, he, you know, he'll cough. And then things just start coming alive. And then then you'll hear the uh, mocking birds and robins. And we used to have quail in my younger and you'd hear them. You know, on the roost, but we don't have them no more. They, they're gone. And uh, like I say, we'd be in the topic of where they go, but used to, go all those sounds. But that's all a part of the bow hunt, is watching, is watching animals uh, in, their, in their habitat and learning, and learning from them. You know, I always ask myself, why do you do that? Why do you do that? It's like <laughs> fishing. You catch a fish. Why? Okay. What do they do? Why do you do that? There's usually a reason. There's a pattern. There's a reasoning of why they did that. Yeah, and that's what like um, that's what's so hard for uh, the non-hunting community to understand about hunters is it's not is there so much more to this to this than than shooting that animal. I mean, it's it's just like you said. I mean, it's almost it's like a big puzzle that you're piecing together year after year after year after year. It doesn't matter what age you get to. That the woods are always going to teach you something. It doesn't matter how many deer you've shot, how many turkey you've put down. You're going to learn something new from those animals every season. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, what, what kind of questions would he have this week? Oh, okay, the uh, Sentinel Decoys fan questions. I guess we can go ahead and hop into that. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but Sentinel Decoys is giving away a free decoy to one of my lucky listeners in the next, uh, actually within the next week. Next episode is the last episode for it. But all the listeners have to do to enter the to win one is just submit a question to one of my guests on Twitter, and that gets them into the uh, contest. And each week, I pick two listeners' questions to read to the guests. So, without further ado, Sentinel Decoy fan question number one comes in from at Aaron underscore Taggerson on Twitter, and he asks, what is your preferred method of calling and why? And does it change as the season goes on? And this, I believe, he's referring to turkey. Okay. Let's go right back to to daylight. That crow comes. Okay. Well, when that crow comes off of the morning, that turkey will usually gobble to him. And you hear a wow out there, and I'm only I've got a little bit of sore throat, but I'm gonna do a little calling, natural voice. For you here, but that old old owl, he comes that old barred owl, and goes, (laughs) he gobbles back at it. Watch that turkey. I got I I got chills, Steve. I feel like I'm in the woods. When that what that turkey responds to. Is a different sound. My voice is different than yours. Your voice is different to mine. We, that turkey, the sound that he responds to best is what I use. in when when I'm calling, if it's if it's a slight call and I'm using a slight call, then I'll change the striker up to change the tone. I use my natural voice 
I keep it as an ace in the hole. I keep my natural voice as an ace in the hole. Uh, because I can change it, but I would rather use a either a diaphragm. I like a triple reed diaphragm. But I will let him respond what I want to call to because I'm, I'm hearing what he's respond, responded to because 90% of the time it's either been a owl, it's been a crow, it's been a blue jay, it's been a train whistle. You know, I've got an, I've got an old horn that come off a of A model old, old Buick or something. I had an old, old car horn that I blow. I use as a, I used to locate sometimes I keep in the truck or boat or sometimes I throw in a pack if I'm around that railroad because a lot of times I horn. But the tone is what I'm trying to explain to you is that is what dictates what I'm going to call, what I'm, what sound, which, which one I'm going to use, the wing bone or if it's a slate, if it's a box call. But I'm going to change it up what, what he's responding to because if that turkey, when he turns, when you get him turn, you get him talking, and he's 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 hand up or he's he's there where he's at, and and you call to him, and he's he's giving this nonchalant call, but when he makes that turn that he's coming, it's a entirely different sound, and that sound comes, and what he responds to is the tone or the call I'm going to use, and most of the time I pick the call. According to what he's using, or what he's what they're they're gob, gobbling to, you know, if it's if it's that oh uh, coarse hen, and she she'll have a little you know different different, different she get down <laughs> she have a lot of rest. Of course, this is my natural voice, and I I normally use a you know diaphragm, but I do use natural voice, but my Key point is when I get one coming, I will get the tone and I'll get down to purrs and clucks. And when I get him in, when he's, he's on a string, then I just use my natural voice and I use that cluck and purr. And this, this is natural voice. And the only turkey contest I ever got into, and that's another story. I don't know if we have time to tell it or not. But I. Oh, we got nothing but time. But. Uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 is the highest that a judge can give. Um, that's how they scored from 20 on down. And I scored 19 using natural voice on the clucks and purrs. Of course, the judges did oh. not, not know that they was scoring, uh, you know, his diaphragm is open. But uh, uh, I use my natural voice, and I use the, the cluck and purr. And, you got to give us some of that, Steve. <laughs> but I get down there. Oh my god, that main, is amazing. Main thing, main thing is pay attention to what he's responding to. If he's responding to just uh just clucks and purrs, if he's responding to uh you know, uh, wing bone, what he's responding to, if he's coming right back and he's <laughs> double gobbling, he's coming right back, he's right back with another, then you stay with what he's doing. But the main thing is be patient. And the key, the, the thing the person, the you know, somebody's novel to this is their setup. The setup, the setup is, is the key to it. Because most people want to be out there where they can see a long ways. Where they, they can see, you know, a long ways. Well, turkey, you're, you're reversing nature when you call that Tom in. He's going to be where he can see where that noise is. And he's going to come as far as he can see to that spot. If I like to sit, I like to take high ground. And I always said, if there's six inches of high ground left, if you leave six inches of high ground behind you, that golfer's going to take it. He's going to take high ground. 
So I try to get high ground. If I'm on a ridge, I try to get back where he's got to come up. He can't see me unless he come up not 15, 20 yards. I set my decoys out there 15, 20 yards from me. But he can, he's got to come in that open spot, in that spot, to see me. And and most of the time, you're going to see his head. Uh, that's what you're going to get a lot of times. But, uh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But, you, that's, but that's if, he can, see, if than... he can see you, uh, he's not He's not going to come in. I used to use this as an example when I was doing seminars at Bass Pro. It's two-story. In the lower, lower part, you know, you can see down there and there there's the clothing, the fishing department. And up top, you know, there's a rail and you can look down and you can see it. And, and so I'd have all those guys was talking turkey. I'd have Mary and I said, I said, uh, I said, you, I said, you want to be where he can't see you. And you can't see him. Because if you can see, if you see him, you can see you. Because it'd be simple as this. And I said, I'd, I'd pick out, I said, is your wife or your girlfriend with you? And I said, yeah. I said, is she down there? Yeah, I see her over. I see her over. She's looking close, and we'd all be looking. I said, get your phone right there and call her and tell her to look up at you. So he'd pick her phone up, and she'd you know, be looking close, pick her phone up and call her and say, look up here at me, honey. And she'd look up and wave, and he'd wave back at her. I said, that's what that gob was looking at. If he can, if he can see you, and that's what he wants, here I am. I'm waving at you. Now you come to me. Mmm. That's uh, that's that's some knowledge right there, Steve. I've never even thought of turkey hunting in that regard. I'm always setting up to where I can see as much land as I can see. You tell me I'm approaching it all wrong. Well, the thing about it is, if you if 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 you was an orange, and I was over on the next ridge, then I see you. Right. You know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And so if if you can see that distance, he can see you. So you want to be where he can't see you. Now you'll have that turkey that he's he's hand up or you know I get excited. The turkey, the turkey, most of the turkeys killed uh, dinner time, eleven o'clock, two o'clock. I mean, you get one after he's bred the hens, and he's, you know, and the hens left, and he's by himself midday, and if you can get him to gobble, or if he's messed up and gobble, you can set up on him and you can kill him. You, if you got patience, you can kill him. And uh, I use uh, I usually cover a lot of ground trying to, to set up now, unless I'm in place that private land and I can't go no further, you know, than than that land will legally allow me to. But I'll I'll just mm-hmm. have to admit over the years a turkey's taken me some places I know I ain't supposed to be. You know, <laughs> it just has. And if I, if that does that and I run in and I and I I, I come out of this this you know, it, it puts me, turkey season opens up uh, in spring. And we don't have no fall season in the area that I live, the, the county I live in. We don't have fall. Okay. Enough. So, but because I love, love the bow hunt so much, you, it's funny, you know, it's like going to a big buffet and you like everything. So you got to have to pick. You know, if I'm going to get crazy for spring turkey season, I've got to save some of that craziness for spring turkey season. So I don't do much fall. Uh, I do I do do mine in the in the in the spring, and I you know but uh, I just get I just get crazy in that period of time. And the uh, quarters I have help me. <laughs> it's all right. Wait, I think you you it, it, you answered that question perfectly. So we'll move on to the next question here. The second Sentinel Decoys fan question is from at TNRifleMan865 on Twitter. And he asks, when a Tom has hung up but still gobbles to calls and leaf scratching, 
what tactics would you use to make him close the distance? Okay. That, that's a tough one right there. He's, he's, you've got, you've got to, you've got to make that move. And I had a, I had a turkey this year that was very similar to what he's talking about. He was hung up. He was not coming. He was not coming. He was hung up. He was not coming. Mm -hmm. So I just kept moving, and I kept moving, and I kept moving, and I kept moving. I got, you know, and I and I tried to I tried to do it an angle, becoming closer to him, and finally, I hit the spot that that I was that I I hit a spot that that he liked. And when I when I hit that spot, he turned he turned that just it's it's really hard to explain this call, but he he's just gobbling and he's it's just it's just like a nonchalant call. He's just gobbling but he ain't he ain't really in it, you know, he's just gobbling just like you know. But when he makes that I'm a coming it's like I'm going to explain it this way. It's like somebody's got a great voice in singing, and they're singing just the words. Versus somebody that's got a great voice in singing, and they put it hard in it. Mm-hmm. it, it it's, it's different. When he makes that, he's turning. You will tell. You can tell by the by by the voice by the change. And when he makes that when he makes that turn, you gotta pick again, you gotta pick your set up right, because you don't pick your set up right, he's coming in and uh you ain't gonna get shot. And that's where moving and changing, you know, and, and running the guns I call it. uh a lot of times the setup will key. Because he you come in, uh that particular bird I called him in, and I got him in. He was 20, 20 yards or so before he was standing with the, the foliage, you know. And that's the difference between early, early hunting and late. This was late. Uh, it turned green, and I could not identify that I that I had really clear shot it. And he was such an old bird. I mean, he was, he was he was carrying a rope. He looked like he's four year old bird. He had some pretty good hooks on him. I could see him just glimpses parts of him, and uh, I could probably kill him. But I, again, it ain't about pulling the trigger. It's having respect. And uh, so I didn't pull the trigger. And my cousin that was with me, he said, "You didn't have an opening." I said, "Not enough that I that I could kill him dead." And I was, I was afraid I'd crippled him. And I, he'd lived too long for for that. But change locations. Find the call that he will gobble to. Change it up a little bit. Change locations, and try to try to stay with him, but don't bust him. If you got some. sounds like the uh, the moral to the uh, the story here is to be flexible right. and to not just keep throwing the same thing over that, and over. So it sounds like you want to. Go ahead. No, you go. Yeah. It sounds like you want to master as many different types of calls as you can in your arsenal. I mean, whether it be box calls, diaphragm calls, slate calls, different strikers, different slates. I mean, have as many different utensils as you can physically carry with you to be it and still be effective in the woods, so that you can you can keep throwing at the turkey, right? I mean, exactly. Is that, is that you, essentially what you're you saying? Would you fish your bass tournament with with you know, or once one one rod and uh, rooster tail. That no, I would not. So yeah, that that is a great analogy. I mean, maybe that's where I. Uh, I mean, like I said I'm new to turkey hunting as well. But you won't so, catch. I mean, you, I, you probably you, you might catch the lock, locker. You know, you might catch you might catch some fish. I mean, that's good lure. You might catch some fish. That they might be the pattern might be just right down your alley. But it's not. Right. But not not, not every be. day. They may be they may That's be right. suspended, you know, ten foot. They may be, you know, on a hump down there. 
they, they may be in the brush pile. You know, that's what I'm saying. No matter what you're doing or when you're doing it or what it is, then you've got to pattern where you're squirreling or whatever. You've got to pattern it. And, and when, something, when, when something does something, why do you do it? You know, I don't believe in coincidence, not just me. But uh, I'm, you know, have you got another question? No, that's it. That's all well, of them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this, this eclipse coming up, the solar the eclipse that we're fixing to have in the United States mm-hmm. here, I'm wondering how it affects wildlife movement. And the reason I say that, Several, it's been several years ago. I used to bass fish and loved to night fish for bass. And uh, me and my cousin was going, going bass fishing one night. And we did not know the four technology and didn't really know that there's going to be a lunar eclipse that night. And we started right before daylight, I mean, right before dark. And uh, we were. Uh, you know, his average was catching, you know, getting strike, nothing nothing right home about, but it, nothing was getting few bites. It's full moon and went then it started that eclipse. And Jason, I have never seen fish hit. We was fishing riff raft in parallel and going buzz baits and spinner baits and it was ever cast. Ever really? cast. We caught in the 70s that night. And from the time it started to the time it ended, we caught them like crazy. And a few years after that, we had a lunar eclipse, and I was bow hunting time. And I knew where this little buck was that I'd been seeing. And I seen him pass through. And I had a, thick, I had a stand to hunt in the thicket. And... I told my wife, I said, I said, I'm going to go hunt that, I'm going to hunt that piggy. I said, I said, oh, book. I said, that lunar clips last night. I said, I want to wait to do that. He would not leave that thicket, Jason. He stayed in that thicket. He stayed in that thicket. He, you know, he wouldn't move. There. He, he stayed to that thicket. And uh, I grabbed him in and killed him 30 yards. Uh, uh, but I grunted him in. I kept grunting, you know, making a little noise with a grunt to you, and finally called him in and killed him. But I bet he was in there for, I, I was seeing from daylight till I think it finally I shot him nine. But he would not leave that thicket. Wow. And I, and I, you know, I know, I noticed that, that turkey, I keep, you know, I, I watch what they're doing. But I, the barometer, now the barometer, Old turkey, if it's thirty, if it's if it's rising in thirty, he generally gobble. If it's falling below thirty, dropping, it's tough. They won't gobble. But I watch that barometer how it rises. I look at it's a rise, and I said they're gonna gobble. And up in the morning, a lot of times you can feel the barometer. I can. You feel it, you know, by make the pressure raise. So. uh Things like that. I'm wondering. I'm wondering what they're doing. I'm hoping that people's got some trail cams out, and stuff like that, that they record. See if they see anything different in that. Not that we're going to have an opportunity to pattern that or anything like that. It's just good thing. That It'll be interesting to it, see. It's yeah, because when I'll... things change like that, what it does. And uh, I, if somebody goes fishing out there, listen, they go fishing that day. Uh, you know. So that sad effect. Hell, after what you, after what you told me, I think about calling off work that day and going fishing. <laughs> well, I I wonder. I mean, it, it it you know it's not a coincidence. You know, full moon. You you heard it. You know, people. You know, they go crazy. Yeah. It's like police officers. It's full moon. They're crazy. Well, it there's something to that. You know, things just don't just don't happen just to happen. You know, a lot of times. You're right about that. 
All right, Steve. Well, we are running at about an hour and 20 minutes, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. But I, I had a great time, and we'll definitely uh, have to have you back on the show again. Maybe we well, can thanks for having me. I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed it tremendously. I'll give you a last but, call. Here's how I'll leave. Okay. <laughs> That's so awesome, man. You have a great talent, and uh, I I get a kick out of it every time I hear it. And like I said, I appreciate you coming on, and we'll definitely do it again. And maybe you can come back on and go a little further into this whole, the whole moon phases and barometric pressure. That's stuff I like to learn a little bit more about, and it seems like you know what you're talking about. So but we're up against it right now, and like I said, an hour and 20 minutes. So if you uh, want to let the people know how they can follow you on Twitter, and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Well, just, call, just uh, look for Turkey Man or... Or, or follow uh, Jason there and, and uh, find Turkey Man and follow me. Uh, I'm just uh, Steve at a bunch of numbers. All I know, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 at Steve four one nine eight seven five three six. Yeah, it's just so. a bunch of numbers. I, I, I had to have <laughs> Give them a I just went, Somebody said it was it's most of my social security number, which is a false fact, but uh, I got kitty for that. Days <laughs> 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 right, been fun. Steve. It's been a blast, and uh, I, like I said, I do appreciate you coming on and sharing some knowledge, and uh, I look I look forward to this friendship we got going on, and maybe one day I'll be able to make it out of so. Tennessee. And I hope so. I hope so. alongside you. Have a good one. You take care, buddy. Bye, you too, buddy. Bye. That's it. That's the show. Thanks for listening. Uh, I love each and every one of you. Your support means so much to me. Thanks for retweeting. Thanks for sharing the show. Thank you so much to Steve Evans for coming on today and sharing his knowledge with us. Uh, I had a lot of fun. It was very enjoyable, and I would love to do it again sometime. And uh, thanks to the sponsors this week, 10 Star Products, www.10starproducts.com. Don't forget to use the promo code IHUNT at checkout to get you 25% off your order. Also, thank you to Beaver Creek Game Calls, www.beavercreekgamecalls.com. And as well, don't forget to use that promo code IHUNT at checkout and get you 40% off. And last but definitely not least, don't forget to check out DeerDecoy.org with my good buddy Steve Henson at Sentinel Decoys. Check out those decoys. Pick you up one. It may make the difference in your season this year. That's it. Until next week, guys. Uh, have a great show next week. We're going to be talking gin- ginseng hunting, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, until then, guys, take care, be safe, and get out in the woods and get some scouting done. Bye.